Good afternoon. I'm, I guess I'm uh, infamous and notorious as being Mr. NDM. And so when the whole thing kicked off in about 2010, um, lots of kind of good things and bad things happened. And I think Dr. Walia said that, you know, it actually was a good thing that it happened in retrospect. It's just a shame the first two or three years of the discovery of that was slightly toxic for various reasons. Um, I could talk a lot about NDM and about, you know, what we do in, in India, what actually happened in India, and I'm not really going to. I just really want to um, highlight just some of the things that are on my slide in the Fleming Fund, and I am the, um, I guess, the, the lead um, or in charge of the uh, operations in, in Nigeria, Pakistan, and, and Bangladesh, and, and not India, but um, their neighbours nonetheless. And so I just kind of wanted to just drill back a little bit and ask what actually makes a successful resistant mechanism. After all, what happens genotypically re relates to what happens phenotypically. And the first thing is that it's actually got to be carried on on commensal bacteria, whether that's Klebsiella in our gut or E. coli in our gut, as Abdul just rightly said. You know, it's, uh, although E. coli does, doesn't turn up in the Chennai clinics in large numbers, actually E. coli is a big urinary tract pathogen and no doubt causes huge issues in, in the community, not necessarily with colistin resistance. Also, I think when you're dealing with countries that have very poor sanitation or suboptimal sanitation, but also in South Asia where pe a lot of people eat with their mouth, uh, sorry, with their fingers into their mouth directly, uh, and, uh, and in China, they don't. The Chinese, uh, they, they have chopsticks. And uh, in Europe, we have knife and fork. And so there's a barrier, there's a physical barrier there between really the environment and what actually enters into our uh, elementary canal. And I think that um, in South Asia, that, that barrier doesn't always exist. So, you know, an organism that actually has resistance in a commensal organism that can spread very rapidly from the community and into normal flora, etc. It should be part of DNA systems that can be freely exchanged. One of the reasons why NDM1 became so successful all those years ago was because it was found on a plasmid called an ink-AC plasmid. And that basically meant that these plasmids were, these little circular pieces of DNA were very broad host range and can move from one organism very freely to another. So we found it in Pseudomonas, we found it in Klebsiella, we found it in E. coli, we found it in Stenotrophomonas multifilia, we found it in bacteria I've never heard of and you've never heard of. And guess what? We also found it in yeast, candida. So what is an antibody-resistant gene doing in candida? Beats me, but it's kind of interesting that it appeared there. And we know that bacteria and yeast share DNA. And so the more diverse these plasmids are, the more freely they're accepted, um, the more they're likely to spread uh, either in the gut or in the environment or whatever. That they are well tolerated. So in other words, this whole idea of cost and fitness so when you plop a plasmid into a new bug, does it actually have a cost? Does it lessen its ability to compete? Is it less fit? And doing a, we're doing a load of studies at the moment with the group in Oxford um, looking at the cost of both the plasmid but also the resistance gene. Um, and as an example of that, MCR, as Abdul just mentioned, actually imposes a huge cost to E. coli. Uh, and E. coli is able to change that around and actually overcome those costs. And some MCR elements are more, have a greater cost burden than others. And I'll come back onto that uh, later. So they should ideally impose very little fitness cost to the bacteria. And if they do that, then the bacteria is happy with them and can kind of maintain them. Often it's, and that's not to do with things like. Um, the copy number of the plasmid and the, also the accessory genes actually on the plasmid itself. And lastly is that they can carry um, genes that um, are able to offer collateral damage. So this morning's conversation was about can we kind of look at quinolone resistance as whatever it may be, other types of antibiotic resistance apart from carbapenem resistance. The fact is that these plasmids often as not have 10, 20, sometimes 25 antibiotic resistant genes on them, the larger plasmids between 150 and 250 uh, kilobases. So therefore, what antibiotic are you going to use? 
You're going to use an aminical oxide, you're going to use a carbapenem, you're going to use a quinolone. They're all gone. They're finished. You know? And so with MCR now kind of joining the rank that's carried on these plasmids, it's kind of game over. And so these plasmids are very uh, fluid. Also the fact that we now have what we call addictive systems on these plasmids. So let me just explain that. The bacteria cannot get rid of the plasmid because if it does, it dies. Okay, it's very simple. It holds the bacteria hostage. So addictive systems or toxin antitoxins are now start, we're starting to get a big handle on and understand how they drive antibiotic resistance and their impact. This is basically a skeletal diagram that was published uh, by uh, a student and myself. Um, and it just, I'm not going to go through it. It's really quite anorecky and, and quite um, detailed, and it just kind of shows the various toxin antitoxin systems of which there are formerly six types, how they act on the bacteria and how they're able to uh, keep the bacteria hostage so the bacteria can no longer actually get rid of the plasmids and therefore cannot get rid of the uh, antibiotic resist resistant genes. Therefore, the question uh, we should ask ourselves is actually is removing, or if you remove an antibiotic, from the environment or from the clinic, will resistance go away? And I just want to um, talk a little bit about NDM5 and a plasmid called X3 plasmid. And it's interesting that the X3 plasmid, since we went back in time and had a look way back in the 80s and the 90s, always had an addictive system on them. And then about something like about 15 years ago, NDM5 plopped into this plasmid. And so when we've looked at this plasmid, and we, I do an awful lot of work in China, we help run the biggest surveillance network in China, both environment and human and animal, and bring it all together, we found that actually NDM5 is everywhere in China in the environment, and particularly in poultry and, and um, pig as well. And so then when we looked at with this kind of going on around the world, where do we find these plasmids? You can see that it's in America, it's in... Uh, Australia, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and that's just looking at uh, databases, genetic databases. This is what the plasmid looks like, and you know it, it's boring. But the most important thing is that on these plasmids you have not just NDM5 but other resistant genes and also addictive systems. So therefore, if we remove ampicillin, which the Chinese use in poultry, is NDM5 going to go away? And this is an in vivo experiment, and this is unpublished data from my colleagues in Beijing. And the TAT stands for the toxin antitoxin system. The plus is the ampicillin, and you can see that's the purple lines. And when we've inoculated the chicken, we've kind of tracked it over a period of time. And you can see that although having ampicillin actually gives you a higher yield of the bacteria, when you actually don't have the antibiotic, ampicillin, actually the numbers, the prevalence, actually start to increase. And so actually removing the antibiotic, particularly over a reasonable amount of time, isn't going to make a jot of difference. We're kind of trying to extend that out um, to see the long-term effects, what it will mean for both China and actually for the rest of the world. So it's important to note that removing antibiotics per se isn't going to get rid of antibiotic resistance. Having said all that, and then this is, again, unpublished data from the Chinese Ministry of Health. Um, the document on the left-hand side is the official document, um, the government informing hospitals and the poultry sector in particular and the Ministry of Agriculture that to ban uh, colistin from the use as a growth promoter in chickens and less, less so in pigs. And so what's actually happened in China over the last couple of years, you've got 2016 data, 2017 data, and you can see by and large the removal of colistin has mean a lesser effect or less prevalence um, throughout the poultry sector, throughout the environment, and also human normal flora. So in this case, it seems to work. But that's because there's no addictive systems or toxin antitoxin systems associated with it and also the resistance is actually much simpler. MCR, we usually find on the single plasmid uh, with very few other antibiotic resistant genes. So it can work, cause and effect can work. This is our predictions and why we're doing it, and Sharon made a comment earlier on that actually using whole genome sequencing to try and understand where resistance goes and its burden, etc., is important. So we think that MCR1, yes, it has 
spread around the world, and it's in Bangladesh, and it's in India, and it's in Pakistan, etc. And indeed, it's in Thailand and Laos, etc. But actually, we think MCR3 is going to be dominate uh, the scene in China and Southeast Asia because it has less fitness associated with it. And then DM5, because it's associated with the toxin antitoxin system, is actually looking more prevalent. And our data in Pakistan, and particularly in Bangladesh, throughout the medical colleges, would show that. So the reason why we're doing that is to try and predict what all of this will look like by 2030, 2040. It's uh, okay, I've got stuck. I, I, I wrote this article, and I just really want to put it up here because it was a kind of a review. And the reason why um, Nature and Microbiology asked me to write this article is because I got so infuriated with the concept of people using One Health incorrectly. And people think that doing a, a few, sampling a few animals in, in, in Lagos and then uh, human samples in Abuja or Kanu is One Health. It is not. And we can talk about that later, but you must have defined studies with really good connectivity to understand actually what One Health is. So here we go. This is about India. And essentially, has India's initiative been successful? I asked Abdul earlier on about the Chennai Declaration, which kind of followed on. In fact, actually was about the same time this article was written. And we can debate that um, for a while. But I would just leave you with one example, because time's running out. When we've tried to set up Barnard's, which is a clinical neonatal study, which we uh, have done in, in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, and India. The same ethical agreement was throughout seven countries. In Pakistan and Bangladesh, it was signed off in three weeks. In India, it took 17 months. And that kind of gives you some idea of some of the logistical issues and the bureaucracy that we have to face when we try and do uh, international studies. And it will be useful if we can try and find some way of circumventing um, those difficulties. These are my um, collaborations, and you'll see that India is amongst them. And I'm very proud to be part of that. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks.